understanding creation, what is the difference between data and interpretation. Um, we've been going through the book uh, Understanding Creation uh, for the last several weeks. And um, uh, the book is written by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. And there are 20 chapters which are done as questions and which are intended to be standalone and which are intended to be read by people with a relatively short uh, memory uh, and attention span. So they're 1,800 to 2,400 words. Um, and um, this week, uh, the question that was uh, posed was, what is the difference between data and interpretation? And this was given to Elaine Kennedy, and this will be her uh, take on it. And then, of course, I'll give my take, and then you guys can uh, give your take. Uh, just uh, for those of you who don't know Elaine, she is a uh, uh, she obtained her bachelor's degrees in geology and teaching sciences at Phillips University. With further studies at Oklahoma State University, she taught secondary school earth and life sciences in Oklahoma and California. And uh, somewhere in the middle of this, she uh, became an Adventist. Uh, she then came to uh, Loma Linda and got a master's in geology and then went to uh, um, uh, Southern California for a PhD. Between 1991 and 2005, which is 14 years, she served as a researcher at the Geoscience Research Institute. She's offered, authored several book chapters and journal articles on science and faith and has published a book for everyone who is young at heart entitled Dinosaurs, Where Did They Come From, Where Did They Go? The question that Kennedy deals with is a legitimate part of science and it has relevance to the creation evolution controversy and Kennedy points both of these out. <coughs> she notes that a data may be biased but still need some explanation by any interpretation. On the other hand, interpretations cannot be elevated to normative status like data can. And the interpretations always rest on the data underneath. The data disappear, the interpretation has no support. She explores the basis for creation science briefly and uh, uh, makes an argument that there is such a thing and that it, uh, uh, that it can uh, at least make reasonable sense out of a good share of the data. She starts out her article by saying, consider the following statements. And then she gives four statements. Statement one, A is a human being, B is a gorilla. There are many similarities between A and B, but A has many superior attributes compared to B. Um, statement two, the similarities show that A and B had a common origin, evolution. The superiorities, uh, I misspelled that indicate that A evolved more progressively than B since their divergence from a common ancestor. Uh, statement three, the similarities show that A and B had a common origin creation. The superior attributes of A indicate that God created humans in his own image. This was not the case with the creation of animals. And statement four, the similarities show that A and B had a common origin creation. The superior attributes of A indicate that God directed the evolution of A which presumably was his method of creation. God may or may not have directed the evolutionary path of animals subsequent to their creation. Statement one is data. Observable, knowable, and open to experience. Statements two, three, and four are interpretations of facts. One by an evolutionist, one by a creationist, and one by a theistic evolutionist. This illustration reveals that knowledge of information can be divided into two separate concepts, data and interpretation. Since data are subject to interpretation, both researchers and non-scientists must distinguish between the information constituting the collected data and the information derived from the data that is presented as evidence in support of a hypothesis. Although scientists endeavor to be objective, certain factors, you can call them biases if you want, uh, 
influence selection and interpretation of data. The information provided to the general public is often more interpretation than data. Boy, is that ever true. For this reason, it is essential for us to develop and apply critical thinking skills. Uh, what do we mean by data? Well, <clears throat> data consists of measurements and observations used as a basis for reasoning, discussion, or calculation. That's a standard dictionary uh, Webster's in this particular case, uh, Webster's Collegiate. While observable data are not are usually regarded as unalterable facts, they may or may not be true. As technology and science progress, facts are discarded, modified, or replaced with new data. Uh, for example, measurements may form a basis for identification and interpretation of an object or phenomenon. That's something that's interesting. The data even themselves are not totally secure. As Popper observed, they're, uh, they're almost subject to what you might call a jury trial, you know, where people say, yeah, we'll agree with that piece of data. Um, that the distinction is, is not clear between data interpretation, but that's because the data becomes more interpretation than because the interpretation can become more data. Fossils of extinct organisms, this is one of her examples, are often identified based on measurements of body parts that have been preserved. The accuracy and precision of the measurements make correct identification difficult because with many of the extinct fauna, scientists don't know whether or not large organisms with similar structures to small organisms represent different species, developmental stages, or gender. The actual identification or, or calculations are not data, they are interpretations. Much of the controversy, I uh, missed that typo too, in the scientific literature occurs because interpretations are drawn from limited databases. Uh, that an interpretation interplay in a complex way as an illustration of the complex interplay between data and, to inter and interpretations consider two steps involved in the process of merely identifying rocks and minerals step one interpretations of light properties of minerals Light properties of minerals are described from the microscopic examination of a very thin slice of rock, what they call a thin section. Polarized light is used to conduct tests on the light properties of each mineral in the thin section. The tests prove a, provide a visual databases of light's transmission patterns. Mineralogists use these patterns to determine the sample's composition. This little piece transmits polarized light in a particular way. This little piece over here transmits it in the same way. This little piece transmits it in the same way. The assumption is made that those are all the same and are probably the same mineral as what we've seen before that does the same thing. Identification of the minerals is an interpretation based on the light property data. So you have an interpretation since they look kind of like a calcium carbonate, they probably are calcium carbonate, for example. Step two is determination of rock type. Rock type can be determined by examining the contact of one mineral with another and measuring how much of each mineral is present. A geologist who identifies the rock considers the mineral identification data even though the identification is actually an interpretation of an interpretation. Certainly, we well, can say one phase. The mineralogical data were originally determined from the light property data. And they were determined not only from the light property data, but from the light property data of other things that we had uh, determined already uh, what minerals they were. Thus, the scope of what constitutes data is actually quite narrow. Just how valid is identification? Identifications can be made using comparisons with standards. For example, three thin sections may have the same mineral composition, but the mineral contacts may be very different. 
If the mineral grains interlock, the rock is igneous. If they are altered, distorted, elongated, and aligned, it is metamorphic rock. The same minerals cemented together form sedimentary rock. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that that's not the definition of igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary. Sedimentary rock, by definition, is laid down by sediments of some kind, either air or water carrying things along, and uh, then them settling into position and gradually becoming cemented together. The assumption is that if you have stuff that looks like it's cemented together, then it must be sedimentary. Maybe that's, uh, that's an assumption. So there's assumptions and assumptions and more assumptions, some of which are probably good and some of which may not be so good. And it's important whenever you're dealing with something to look at the assumptions that are there. When terms and procedures are well-defined, identification is fairly easy and relatively reliable. However, since data are limited to what we can measure or directly observe, we must take care in its interpretation in order to reach reliable conclusions. An interpretation is an explanation, and interpretations are limited by the availability of data and by the bias of the observer. And uh, there are multiple levels of interpretation. We've already seen uh, uh, something that had at least two, three layers there. Several layers of interpretation exist. For example, the term oolite not only identifies a rock type, but also implies an entire history of environmental requirements and depositional conditions for its formation. How can a simple term carry that much interpretive information? Well, we're going to give an example. First, a thin section of round bead-like particles cemented together must be identified. That's, you have to have that for oolite. Uh, with respect to its mineralization, the first level of interpretation is to identify the mineral composition of the little beads. For the purposes of this illustration, let's identify them as par particles of calcium carbonate because that's what most oolites are in fact made of. Um, identification of the structure of the round bead-like rock is based on recognition of a central object. For example, a piece of some other kind of rock or a bit of shell material around which the calcium carbonate has precipitated. This structural information coupled with the roundness of the particles identifies the beads as oolites. At this point, one might think that identification has concluded. However, a third level of interpretation is introduced to explain how the oolites were formed. The third level relies on observations of current environments. Geologists know that oolites are typically formed near a shore by the agitation of warm, shallow, saline waters and apply this knowledge to oolitic rocks found on a mountainside. In other words, geologists assume that the mountain oolites formed at this, that site sometime in the past in the same way that oolites form in the ocean or Utah's Great Salt Lake. This in interpretation implies that oolites don't form in any other way. The reasoning seems logical, however, this association may not be true. This set of interpretations is now added to other data with multiple interpretations bringing us to the final description of a particular rock exposure or outcrop. The stuff came from somewhere where there could be uh, calcium carbonate rich waters with little pieces of stuff being agitated in them and gradually growing concretions around those uh, little pieces of whatever they were, rock, bits of shell, whatever, uh, sand grains maybe and uh, forming little balls. That's interesting because sometimes when you see oolites, at least in, um, in New Mexico I've seen this, uh, they seem to fit into each other, which is a really odd thing to have happen. And I'm not sure how that works. Do they just sort uh, that way, do they form round and then gradually compress? Um, it's kind of interesting to try to visualize how that would work. 
Geologists use other rock types and additional data to develop models to describe geologic events in Earth's history. For example, cemented quartz grains are called sandstones. Patterns in sandstone may be due to the process of cross-bedding. Typically, cross-beds are formed as currents, wind and or water, deposit sand and silt on the lee slope of dunes. By integrating regional data and interpretations, geologists develop the fourth level of interpretation, modeling. Models provide scientists with a generalized framework for developing predictions and assessing events that may have occurred in the past. A model like a bunch of dunes in the desert gradually filling in the back end and having more and more sand dumped on them and as they do making a long area of, of beds that go sideways to the actual layers that are being laid down. Um, maybe water being dumped uh, or having sand dumped on it and then laying it down at the back end of uh, underwater dunes and there are such things. And how did you tell the difference? Thus, when evaluating research, it is essential to make the distinction between data, what you actually see, and interpretation, how you explain it. The validity of an interpretation is based on how well it accommodates available data. This interplay between data and interpretations is what makes science so successful and progressive. That is, as long as you don't let the interpretations take over the function of the data. Bias during data acquisition. Scientists are aware that they are subject to error and misconception. However, they try to maintain an objective attitude. Um, and interestingly, the references to uh, Francisco Ayala et al. Um, in a book on science. Uh, people who often prefer to believe that scientists deal with, uh, often prefer to, uh, to believe that scientists, uh, scientists deal with absolute. Some, t uh, some even think that when a scientist draws a conclusion, all questions have been resolved and competing theories refuted. Uh, I would say that those who are aware of uh, philosophy of science are extremely aware that that's a false statement. To complicate matters, the scientific community has adopted the position, um, and unfortunately this is true for the uh, majority and for the official scientific bodies, that any researcher having a religious bias is non-scientific. Therefore, by de definition, creation science cannot be true science. Such an attitude fails to recognize its own bias. And uh, her references for that are Del Ratch, uh, The Battle of Beginnings, and, and uh, uh, also Philip Johnson, Darwin on Trial. Here are some biases that influence science, some technical, some subtle and unconscious factors. And unfortunately, sometimes they rise to consciousness but are not deliberately fought down. Uh, sampling constraints. The first problem in ga data gathering is sampling bias. Every scientist has some preconceived ideas about the research that influences the selection of data. Various sampling methods help minimize problems, and she gives a reference for how to try to minimize it, but that, of course, admits that the problem exists. Even then, choices may favor a particular hypothesis. If you look in certain areas, you're more likely to find stuff that fits your particular hypothesis than if you look in other areas. Systematic errors. The scientist may have a blind spot, a failure to recognize data, and here she gives an example. For example, it is common that for a paleontologist specializing in fossil snails to collect a wider variety of gastropods, that is snails, than anyone else at a site. However, that same individual will have fewer clams and corals because they see the snails more. These fossils could significantly impact the scientist's interpretation, but the researcher's bias eliminates that input. This isn't something people do deliberately. It's something that just happens naturally. Furthermore, the processing of data can introduce systematic bias. And her reference is, uh, is a st standard statistical thing on the web. 
an unrecognized faulty procedure or any incorrectly implied mathematical formula or statistical analysis introduces a systematic error or bias into the record. Now, technological constraints. Scientists can now incorporate large quantities of data and interpretations into computer-generated models through analyses involving pattern recognition. However, gigantic databases do not necessarily mean that models adequately reflect complex systems and processes. The development of simplified models with computer-generated systems produces technological bias because it's easier to model some things than others. Um, because the simplified parameters place limits on the application of the model to real systems. And uh, again, she has a standard uh, reference in, re in this regard. Uh, I think it's important to note that these problems are not just problems that she's pulling out of the top of her head, but they're well recognized in the literature itself. Quality of data. Analysis of data introduces bias due to the inclusion of qualitative or subjective interpretations. In other words, what you're doing is you're taking the data and you're immediately processing it so that it doesn't, uh, before you even analyze uh, what it might mean in several different uh, scenarios, you immediately process it, process it into your favorite scenario. Um, for example, the analysis of potassium argon data. The quantity of potassium in argon can be measured very precisely. However, it is difficult to know just what the data mean, and the conclusions relative to age depend heavily on numerous assumptions. And I find it fascinating she cites a secular uh, author on that. Current technology does not measure the age of the rock directly. There isn't little tiny ages stamped on the rock. You measure the potassium, you measure the argon, you put it through a formula, and you hope all the assumptions that are required for the formula to work are actually true. Thus, the conclusions drawn are interpretations. Descriptive data are even more problematic. Financial constraints, and this is fascinating, Scientific method requires vi rigorous testing before any theory can be accepted. However, time and monetary constraints increase technical bias by limiting the experimental process. New data are incorporated into current theory because it is easier to get material published if it is generally accepted by the scientific community. So what she's saying is that new data are often immediately processed into the standard theory so that people can know what they mean well, if the standard theory is, has problems, that means that um, you're going to have a skewed interpretation of that data. The funding process has an incredible influence on research today. And interestingly enough, again, she cites Ayala and Black. Um, uh, the rigorous testing proposed by the scientific method is not cost effective. So ideas and concepts are rushed into print, then cited as evidence in subsequent publications when their evidentiary value is not as clear as might otherwise be expected. This is why, well, this is one of the reasons why every new fossil it gets touted as the answer to a problem. Because, you see, if it's the answer to a problem, then they'll fund you for more study on it. Um, inter implications for science and religion. When it comes to the interface between science and religion, several points need to be noted. First, not all data are accurately measured, and it is sometimes hard to differentiate between data and interpretation. Multiple alternative interpretations of any database are not only possible but probable. Although the simplest theoretical scenario is usually preferred over the more complex one. Second, bias is present in any interpretation because all scientific interpretations are at least partly subjective. Third, we must understand the nature of science and how scientists work. Se people sometimes get discouraged because scientific interpretations seem to be constantly changing. 
They're not sure what to believe. However, that is the nature of science and how it advances. Once one grasps this aspect of science, one is reluctant to base theological beliefs on specific data or specific concepts. Fourth, while science may provide relevant information, it should not dictate theology. If it is allowed to do so, then every time scientific interpretation is changed, theology has to alter, whether or not that alteration is consistent with one's belief system and experiences. And I would emphasize especially experiences. Um, at the same time, theology should not dictate any one science. Concepts such as the fixity of species held by many in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, cited by Brown, and belief in a geocentric universe are some ideas that contributed to conflict between science and theology. The Bible can supply legitimate working hypothesis and constraints for scientific investigation, interpretation. And this is one place where she starts to talk about kind of a creationist theology. In fact, scriptures as an information source points to avenues of investigation that would not be considered by most non-Christian investigators. However, such research should acknowledge any scriptural bias present and all the data must be fairly evaluated. That is, if we're doing this kind of thing, we need to be careful not to withhold data, distort data, or do anything else with data other than simply report it as we get it. And we need to be careful to say that this is an interpretation uh, based partly on the data and partly on um, our Christian presuppositions. I don't think it does us any good to pretend to be totally neutral. Um, and uh, by implication, pretend that everybody else is uh, totally biased. Uh, nevertheless, particularly in the area of origins, science alone cannot assess the complete database. This is because the scientific approach, at least as currently stated, not back in the days of Newton, but uh, today, um, rejects the possibility of supernatural involvement in Earth's history. Although some scientists are theistic evolutionists, many scientists believe science and scripture are simply irreconcilable. And uh, the, the one she cites is Norman, who talks about no, the Nobel Prize winners who condemn creationism. For example, Ayala states, and this is also from Norman's paper, to claim that the statements of Genesis are scientific truth is to deny all the evidence. Another scientist said, not only is the present the key to the past, but the present is the key to the future. Which uh, sounds uh, a lot like Hutton's claim. Uh, it's a personal communication that she got. Um, some com such comments tend to antagonize many Christians in the scientific community. Both the historical accounts of a worldwide flood and the prophetic ac accounts of Christ's second advent proclaim the falsity of that concept. And here she cites 2 Peter 3. The evidence does not provide either a long or short history for life. It simply provides limited information. Um, the data are not the primary problem in reconciling science and scripture. The primary conflict lies in interpretation of the data, which is, of course, why she's making the point and why she studied this and why they signed it to her is because she's keenly aware of this problem of data and interpretation. Um, for this reason, some believe theistic evolutionists should become the public advocates for evolution. Some hope theistic evolutionists can bridge the gap between science and faith for the general public while marginalizing the creationists. And uh, the reference she cite is actually uh, somebody writing for the National Center for Science Education, uh, Eugenie Scott's group. She finishes up by saying, for many Christians, the historicity of the Bible provides information about creation that su suggests a better way to approach science. 
From this perspective, harmony between science and scripture may be increased. Working with the same data, creationists expect coherence because they recognize God creator, as creator of nature and its scientific laws. Now, I agree with the main thrust of Kennedy's points. I suspect I would go a little bit beyond what's said here. Um, I suspect that just before the second advent of Jesus, there will be enough evidence to persuade any fair-minded person of the veracity of scripture. Of course, the problem with us mostly is that we're not as fair-minded as we like to think. To me, you wouldn't necessarily have to resolve this problem uh, if a person was being fair minded if a person was fair minded already. So all you have to do, you know, when the, when God comes and they would say, "Well, no, it was really like this," they say, "Oh, really? Okay," you know, and then and then you just have a discussion on how where they misinterpreted it. So you wouldn't have to resolve this before Jesus comes necessarily. So that's well, like two bits on it. Maybe I can put it this way. Um, I suspect that, that the final choice is one in which nobody can claim that, well, if God, if you just left the door open in another 20 minutes, I would have decided for you. That the issues have to become clear to everyone. And they have to become clear enough that nobody can really complain about second guessing or more time or any of that kind of stuff. Um, that probation closes not so much because God's tired of this whole mess and he's just going to close it down wherever you are that you're stuck. But rather that it wouldn't have mattered if we'd taken another 10 years. That that at this point the issues are clear enough to everybody that they have everybody that wants them to be clear, let's put it that way. Now people who don't want them to be clear, people who have their own, made their own choice can always fuzz the data. And you know the issue in the end may very well have pressures of a non-intellectual type that are severe. You know, if you, if you do this, you might lose your job. If you do this, you might become unpopular. You might uh, lose status in society. But the issue will not be, well, what really is truth? Because those people will have enough of a sensation uh, that they will understand that in the judgment they can't come back at God and say, you just, you know, you just didn't play fair with me. You didn't make it clear enough. Now, I will say that I think that there are people right now for whom that probably could be said. And that's why, why probation has not closed. But I think that as we get further along, that the function of probation closing is God saying, look, it doesn't matter anymore. The issues are clear enough for everybody. And that will include all fair-minded scientists as well, which means that the balance of evidence, I mean, you could say maybe it will become obvious that the science is equivocal and they have a choice of going after the more or less um, uh, uh, moral solution to those problems. Um, I'm not sure that I can say for absolute dead sure that the science will weigh um, heavier in one direction, but I think that it has to be at least neutral and has to be able to be balanced by other factors to where when you reject the final message, it will be because 
you really didn't want to, not because uh, you were trying to be honest with the evidence. And I think we're getting closer to that point now. I think that for a while, creationists didn't have as much in their armamentarium, and it wasn't, uh, there wasn't as much sense. But I think we're getting to the point where it's starting to be more obvious to anybody who's trying to be fair that at least the standard um, uh, National Academy of Sciences take on, on what science means is not the product of, uh, of people being completely objective and honest with what the data they have, but rather that it is, in fact, uh, skewed by what they want to believe. And I think that, uh, although this is a, a more shaky conclusion, I think that we should be working on this project as, as we have the ability which is one of the reasons why I've been doing the work that I have in Carbon-14 and also one of the reasons why if, uh, when I have the chance I talk about the origin of life and its implications to, to uh, people in general uh, because I see those as, as areas where uh, the evidence is starting to become more on our side. But with that, I will uh, invite further comments and uh, we have a comment back there and then Ariel Roth and uh, then we'll, we'll go from there. Let's go ahead and turn the lights back on. <coughs> Dennis. Uh, Paul, are you saying that uh, someone who may be an agnostic in one or two areas is not going to go to heaven? No, I'm not saying that. Because, uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm kind of in some ways saying the opposite. That at the present time, there will be people for whom agnosticism is actually, in fact, the best option. Um, I am particularly thinking of Antony Flew in his younger days. Um, I don't know how God would have judged him. <coughs> I do know that he grew up in a family that, among other things, believed in eternal torment. And uh, that particular doctrine bothered him a great deal. And it still bothers him. And it's why he hasn't come, uh, or I should say it still bothered him until he died. And it's why he'd never come around to Christianity, although he found it tremendously attractive. He just couldn't see God to many people forever for uh, a temporal offense. And I agree with him. And so this is one of the things that I think that, that God has to work with is sometimes there are positive and, ne uh, and negatives, and sometimes the negatives will outweigh the positives uh, towards somebody believing. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I think, commented that once that there was a person who rejected God, and it was the first r truly honest religious thing that he ever did. And it's precisely for this, not that particular doctrine, but uh, that, let's put it this way. If I believed in the do God that Dawkins describes from the Old Testament, I wouldn't want to believe in him either. But I think that the time is coming when people will have an, uh, have an alternative that is much more clear. And it won't be fleshed out for everybody. I'm not advocating uh, salvation by uh, scientific expertise. But what I am advocating is that the salvation has to be able to reach through uh, 
at least in spite of and possibly partly because of the scientific expertise. And that you, you will, it will come to a point where you make your choices not based on what you think the data are <coughs> uh, or perhaps with their assistance, but rather because you are willing to accept a universe where uh, God behaves like God in fact does. And that the rejection will be not because of the scientific evidence, but because you really don't want God around. And you know, God's the judge of how far that has to be open. But I'm sure that he can do it. And what, I, what I'm arguing is that there's a beyond just simply the data and interpretation, you can accept whatever you want to from science, that in fact, I think if, if we knew everything, we would in fact know that God exists and that uh, the biblical story has a reasonable evidentiary basis. And that it's possible that it becomes practical at the end of time for this to actually be there. That it will not be just a theoretical, but it will be experiential to, to everyone around. Uh, uh, do you have a comment on that? or? Yeah, I'll make a comment on that. Uh, Several things interesting to talk about here, but uh, with what ref you're referring to here, uh, I was interested in a comment made uh, from the pulpit uh, several weeks ago. And the question was, are you willing to live with God? And I think the issue comes right into focus there. Uh, I have seen some Christians turn from the Bible model to the science model, even though the data seem to be saying the opposite. This has bothered me greatly. Uh, and I, it has brought into focus the idea, well, why would a person do that? And it seems to me, to a certain extent, the same problem that uh, arose in the beginning of the controversy, and that is the, the question of uh, our personal ego, our personal pride, and our unwillingness to, to uh, submit to kindness and forgiveness and being willing to uh, live peaceably with others because we feel we are superior. Uh, I think this is one of the basic issues that will happen at the end here in, in this issue. And that is, are we willing to live with God, a God of love, a God who uh, will accept in his kingdom those people who are loving and kind uh, versus people who want to emphasize their personal ego, their personal pride? And I think that's why so Satan, very intelligently, in the end, he's going to decide against that because he can't live with that uh, with a God or the, that kind of God and, and it seems to me that's part of the issue I mean, data is important no question I think that enters uh, at least I, it seems to me I've seen people do this uh, and I'm very concerned about it uh, uh, our intellectual pride can get the best of us at times and uh, this is not the thing that is going to promote eternal peace. Uh, one of your points uh, illustrated this morning, Time Magazine this week has an interview of David Attenborough, whom we've all appreciated. He's been producing for 50 years things on biology. I particularly like the, the series on birds. But in the interview, he said that scripture is not 
a viable option because it's not science. <laughs> Plain and simple. It's not science. You're welcome to it if you wish, but it's not science. It looks like his swan song, and I think he's 84, mm -hmm. is going to be the study of flying dinosaurs. So we have something great to look forward to, the explanation of dinosaurs that fly. Oh, I just wanted to comment. Um, I think one of the uh, on the uh, closer probation uh, subject. Um, I think it's it's important, uh, or a major factor will also be just if people read the Bi their Bible or not. Because if you don't, um, you know, God has so many warnings for people that people human beings actually need to know or have heard or take seriously, whether they read the Bible or not. But just the easiest place to get it is the Bible, actually, I think. And um, uh, several come to mind, um, you know, that we're all mm -hmm. blind and naked. Now, those things, of course, we're not, we're not going to see those as human beings. There's, God's wisdom is far beyond human wisdom. Um, if, for an example, just if a person knew that, um, they would not be so uh, heady and, and high and mighty in their uh, opinions of themselves so much that uh, they could get into to trouble believing things that, or jumping to conclusions or uh, um, where it ends up basically being the wrong conclusion. Um, but a lot of things like this, the wide road is the road of destruction, uh, many things that is far beyond human human wisdom. I think without it, I, I don't I don't know. I think for many people, it seems to be it, it would seem to me it would be impossible for them to uh, to change their mind. However, like you said, it, past this time, things may become much clearer, and I expect them to be much clearer too, and mm -hmm. give people a better chance of changing their mind. The point where it gets shaky is, are, we, uh, mm -hmm. are do we uh, uh, do our small efforts to uh, try to clarify things help any? And that I don't know. Uh, is this something that God's going to just simply reveal to everybody, and uh, all of our efforts are going to be totally worthless? Um, you know, he does tell us to go and teach all nations, and I think that you know, one of the nations that we teach is the scientific nation, if you want to put it that way. So, uh, but um, but it's uh, really it's kind of iffy as to you know how much we're going to do and how much is going to be God's revelation at the end. Um, but there comes a point where you suspect that God appreciates people trying even if they're not perfect on that because uh, Jesus seemed to appreciate the little children who were yelling hosannas at him and said if these shut up the stones will start crying out. I will comment here and then one here. There is the fickleness of human nature. I was once called to the home of a man who was dying and he said, Pastor, I've been a rounder. I've done terrible things. Now I'm dying. Help me. Well, somewhat perplexed, I presented a simple presentation of acceptance of Christ as personal Savior. He accepted Christ as his Savior and was a great deal relieved. Unfortunately, he didn't die. He recovered and went back to his rounder kind of life. So. Sooner or later, human fickleness will be cut short. Your comment about um, go ahead. Your comment about uh, whether we should leave it all to God or God wants us to help with scientific explanations of data, etc. Um, I've always been impressed with where Mrs. White speaks of 
the need for balance between humility and self-respect. She said, if we have self-respect not balanced with humility, we become proud and puffed up. But if we have humility not balanced with self-respect, then we cannot have the weight of influence that God wants us to have, meaning that you have something to offer. You've been put on this earth to offer that, and you and I are expected to share what we have to offer. It may influence somebody who's teetering on the balance for or against God, and that evidence which is biblical or in harmony with biblical evidence, may influence them in the right direction. But it all has to also, there also beside that horizontal balance has to be a vertical balance where we realize that our efforts aren't going to save that person, and they're not going to save us, but that God wants to be able to work through us because that's how we get to walk in his shoes like you might have walked in daddy's shoes when you were three years old. <laughs> oh, you know, it would be so exciting to walk in daddy's shoes or for me to walk in mommy's shoes. So when we do what we can, we get a taste of being the godly people he created us to be. And that's for our pleasure, as well as our character transformation. Let it comment over here. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a worthwhile study that we do, a worthwhile science, a worthwhile endeavor. Evidence is not going to save anybody. But if the evidence can cause somebody to start looking in the right direction, to go in the right direction, then it's worthwhile. And we've got so much evidence on, on evolution, it's nice to have something on the other side to say there's another side of the story. Let's look at this. So it gives a person another tool to make a choice. Uh, there, there are a number of issues here, basic issues that we could address. I think Elaine did an excellent job in analyzing this, <coughs> this uh, controversy, you might say, uh, uh, in terms of data and interpretation. Uh, it's a difficult topic, actually, uh, but I, uh, I wonder, in this, uh, you can raise the question, uh, <clears throat> are we supposed to separate these two? Because when we do this, we establish a certain philosophical outlook that uh, I'm not completely uh, comfortable with. In other words, if you are going to limit your reality to just what you can observe, science, uh, this is a very simplistic approach to truth. Uh, you, you can legitimately say, I want to know what science says. Fine. But when you say, this is my basis for truth, uh, you've narrowed your outlook to an area where I'm not comfortable with uh, because uh, who says that only the observable is is reality? Well, I think that's a very poor um, philosophy of science, and it's one which scientists themselves don't believe. Uh, but they tend to practice it. Well, uh, they, well, they, they practice it selectively. Okay, we haven't seen God. We haven't seen angels. Mm -hmm. At least they haven't. Uh, maybe some of us have. Um, but of course, in, uh, you know, our observations are, are biased and uh, we might be lying and uh, various other things like that. Um, and... Uh, and yet scientists believe in things that they can't see at all, all the time. None of them have ever seen atoms. The closest we get is Brownian motion of small particles under the microscope. Um, we see cloud tracks and we infer sub, uh, uh, subatomic particles. Mm 
We've never actually seen the particles themselves. All we see is the cloud tracks left by them. Um, right now, there are, well, maybe in another hour or so, maybe now, there are college football games being played where we sit. And all you have to have is the right detector to find them. But you can't see those radio waves going through us. Scientists believe in stuff they can't see or feel all the time. To say that, and, and the rest of us do too, to say that because we can't see something it doesn't exist is... Um, <laughs> It's a strange philosophical uh, dictum that, frankly, nobody believes. Unless there are things that we don't want to believe exist. And see, that's, that's the whole issue. Is the reason that you can eliminate God, the reason you can eliminate angels, is because that's a realm we don't want to have happen. And so therefore, since we can't see it, it doesn't exist. I, th I think they get away with that by, uh, because of the fact that you know, what we can observe is we're a little more comfortable with hard data than we are with uh, what you might call uh, softer inferences uh, per se. And so you can, you know, you can't claim, hey, uh, uh, I'm sticking by the, the hard data. Uh, but you know, this is too simplistic. Uh, nevertheless, I think it, it carries a weight of authority because of that. Well, but, but the thing of it is, there is really hard data on how one can form DNA. And one does it by deliberate choice. And there are all kinds of different avenues that could feed into how that works. But they all require planning and execution and careful control over what's being done. There is no pathway. There is no theoretical pathway. There is no experimental evidence for this kind of thing happening without somebody deliberately choosing to make it happen. But that conclusion, even if you make it tentative, is resisted by the scientific community tooth and nail. It has nothing to do with uh, this kind of, da uh, this kind of uh, I can't see it, therefore it doesn't exist. It has everything to do with these are things I don't want to have exist. I... I I tend to agree with you on that. Uh, the materialistic philosophy of science uh, is uh, a thing of the imagination to a certain extent. For crying out loud, right now we have things that can influence the shape of galaxies that consist of over 90% of the matter of the universe. And that standard doctrine, dark matter, you can't see it. You don't have a clue as to what it's made of. The galaxies apparently can just, you know, kind of pass through it without any problems. But that's considered science. See, the, the problem has nothing to do with the visibility or invisibility of something. Uh, you know, whether it influences our eyes or even our telescopes. The problem has to do with there are certain things we don't want to have exist and so therefore we'll say they don't exist and we'll make you prove it. And, there, and, and once you understand that that's the mindset that's behind this, why the National Academy of Sciences has come up with this uh, anti-religious principle. Well, anti all religions except the religions who will give the entire uh, 
uh, visible world over to science. Um, and science being defined as something that doesn't have uh, anything outside of nature that can interfere with it. You know, and yet when they get done, they have dark matter, they have neutrinos that go through stuff and you can't find them, uh, you know, go clear through the earth without being affected. Uh, if you think of the kinds of things that scientists say, and everybody who's a scientist believes, or at least 99% of them, and yet you say that if you can't see God, he can't exist. You know, this is data mining at its worst. And that's why I think that once people understand that, this is, that that's, those are the kinds of issues that you're dealing with, that it will be obvious that science is not a barrier to a great controversy story. Science is ideally practiced as opposed to science that the National Academy of Sciences says. A comment here and um, one there, and I, it's somewhat after 11.30, so we'll uh, kind of close out at that, I think. I'm sure you're referring not just to the sense of sight, but to all five of the senses yes. which scientists can use to validate their theories. Yes. Um, the one percent, you said 99 percent, are being spiritually dishonest, in effect, and choosing to not believe in God because they don't want to. I just, I'm not saying you'd go that far necessarily, but I'd like to speak up for the one percent. Mrs. White says, in most cases, doubt is the result of sin, but she doesn't say in all cases. And there is that one percent or whatever percent. And I think our role is to follow one other thing she said, we are to regard every man as honest. That's an attitude we need to have in order that we don't become judgmental, critical. Um, we may see them believing things, we may hear them saying things which make them look dishonest and biased and pig-headed, <laughs> but we're to regard them as honest, knowing that the Lord may be working at them you know, working with them, working on their their spiritual, and he's trying to balance them towards him. They may be in a fight mode at the moment, but we we can still regard them as wanting to be an honest-hearted person. We can think of them as living up to all the light they have, put them on their honor, and maybe they'll start to live up to that. I I would agree with that. Uh, perspective uh, that it's unwise to approach the person at the beginning with the idea of you just uh, being dishonest and the reason for that is that it's incredibly difficult to understand everything there is to know about a person number one and some of these people have been trained in, a, in looking at things in a particular way. And when you've been trained to look at things in a particular way, it's awfully hard to step outside of that and look at them from a different perspective. Um, <coughs> and sometimes that will be part of our job. Uh, but um, as we... Uh, As we work with it, if they are being dishonest, it's better to let them hang themselves than for us to try to do that ahead of time. Um, and it's a principle I've found helpful in uh, emergency medicine is that uh, the best thing to do for people is to take them absolutely dead seriously. And if they, that way, if they turn out not to be serious, you haven't contributed to that unseriousness. And it becomes evident that 
that um, the unseriousness they have is their own, not something that you put on them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even that will help them to wake up because they'll realize that they're not behaving like a serious person would. I, I'm thinking of people who complain of pain and want drugs, but you know, and at a certain point, your antennae go up and say, uh, something's fishy about this. And so you explore further, but you, but you try to explore always from the mm -hmm. standpoint of um, uh, you must be uh, being honest. Therefore, there isn't any problem with checking this. See? And... Uh, You know, uh, Jesus says for us to be wise as serpents. He also says for us to be harmless as doves, and that's one of the ways of being harmless, I think, is that you don't push them into being bad people. That if anything you do, you invite them out of it. And in fact, if they are being bad people, you still invite them out of it. You don't try to keep them there so that you have the right diagnosis. And I think for scientists, it's the same way. And we had a comment here. And a uh, final one from Ariel Roth. Go ahead. OK, yeah. I, I, well, I thought of a couple other things that science recognizes and that you can't see directly anyway, like a couple simple ones, gravity and magnetism. You can, you know, uh, not directly, you can't see them. They're invisible, as far as I know. But you can see flux lines, and you can obviously see gravity functions. It, um, and that may be similar with dark matter. They're seeing things happening. They just don't know what it is. So they call it dark mm -hmm. matter. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think. Uh, no, you're right. It, yeah. They're invisible forces. Uh, inaudible, you can't smell them. You can't taste mm -hmm. them. Yeah. But you can watch things fall. Uh, even though you're not uh, touching them at all. I guess you could say that you can feel gravity. See the result of them. Or uh, but uh, yeah. the, the same is yeah. true for, for electrical forces. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to feel or uh, see or t taste them or anything. All you do is charge something up and it takes off in a particular direction. And yeah. you realize, you know, there's something there even though I can't tell with my senses that it's yeah, there's there. Evidence, there's evidence, uh, physical evidence that we can see that there's something there beyond it. And, you know, complex electromagnetic stuff with information on it. You know, you turn on the television and suddenly you can hear somebody from Washington, D.C., or you can yeah. watch scenes that are happening in, uh, in uh, 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 Cairo or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And the thing is, if you later visit somebody in Washington, D.C., you can see, were you there? You know, I saw you in the video mm -hmm. and said, yeah, I was there. <laughs> and so you know... Uh, and, and their description will match the video, you know, pretty, pretty closely. And you realize that, you know what, that what was being shown was, in fact, something that's real. It can be a confirmation of Had evidence. a basis in reality. Yeah. And yet you're sitting here and you're getting this message and you can't tell what's going on. You have to have a, a radio or a television set or, some, or yeah. you know, a computer attached to the Internet to be able to... to Pluck this stuff out of the, out of the air. Mm -hmm. Like my, my son watching TV, I mean, he knows nothing about the, what the TV is. He just knows that it's there, and he's seen himself on the TV. That's, you know, that's kind of a mind blower, I guess, sometimes, <laughs> you know. But I mean, um, but they still recognize that, you know, it, it, as an animal would, too. They... they they see things. I mean, we, you know, we turn on lights or off lights. They don't understand, but they accept that that's, that's the way it is. Oh, yeah. I just, um, this morning, I left uh, our parrots to watch a parrot video, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, I, you know, they, they really don't, I don't know that they understand completely all, everything that's going on, but, you know, their <laughs> parrots are that they can watch and enjoy. Um, and... In some ways, our understanding is, is like that of parrots. Yeah. 
And I think that we need to be really careful not to, not to be so hubristic as to think we have it all wrapped up, particularly not to be so hubristic to say that we can wrap it all up without God. Right. And, and when, that's kind of what I was saying when I mentioned uh, blind and naked, as the Bible says we all are, because uh, it's, it's not so much to think, well, uh, now we're nothing but, you know, and, and be like a je jelly, you know, we're, you know, we have, can have, can't have any opinions or anything, but, um, but it, it really is, for the most part, gives us, puts us in our place in a proper perspective. We, as human beings, we need perspective. Yeah, and that's how we get far out of left field um, and get ourselves in trouble in many ways. So, and uh, yeah. I have a final comment. Let's see. I was just going to mention this to add to, add to the picture. Um, you know, Richard Lewington uh, wrote this famous review of Carl Sagan's book, uh, Science as a Candle in the Dark, but in that he makes this perceptive statement that we've mentioned. Uh, before here that uh, in science uh, materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, I, uh, I, I think uh, this tells us something of the complications of the things. You can't allow a divine foot in the door, okay, but you allow a whole bunch of other speculative things in the door. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think this gets back to this issue of uh, pride, intellectual pride, and so on. Uh, our personal ego that I was mentioning earlier uh, as a, a factor in, in this whole controversy uh, between good and evil and, and uh, the final movement and so on that we discussed this morning. So, uh, Rather interesting that he picked up that one factor, we can't allow a divine foot in the door. But he did not pick up uh, dark matter or other things that we've mentioned, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, the idea that uh, fossils exist long before you can find them in the fossil record uh, and so on. There's a lot of speculation out there in science, but no, the one we picked on was a divine foot. And it kind of shows the the importance that they give to God. It, all this other stuff is not important, but God is so important that we have to keep him out. Yeah. If, if, if nothing else, at the expense of many, many universes. Yes. And uh, close to an infinite number of universes. Maybe an infinite number of universes. Uh, y anything but God. And when you realize that, you realize that this is not really a search for God and they couldn't find it. This is a search for any way to eliminate God possible. And that kind of a search is just not geared to finding God. And if, if you try to do it at, with a modicum of fairness, any kind of rationality to it, you wind up doing what Antony Flew did. You know, maybe after 70 years of wandering in the wilderness, but still, you know, you wind up coming, coming up and saying, you know, there really is good evidence. In fact, it's so overwhelming that I can't fight it any longer. It's a perfect example of the wide road is the road of destruction. As you said, what, 90, whatever percent of scientists uh, want to resist that uh, factor, the God factor, you could say, maybe of... Um, explanation for many scientific uh, theories, you know. Actually, in this case, it's not quite that way because 90 plus percent of the National Academy of Sciences is that way. Uh, of the general scientific faculty in uh, universities, it's actually more like 45 percent and there are about 40% who believe in God. So, you know, these people have control of the top, but they are actually terrified mm -hmm. that they're going to lose control. And it wouldn't take a lot. Uh, and that's yeah. uh, one of the things, when people start yelling a lot, it's because they're nervous. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, this gets into this power and ego issue, and they're going to lose control. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Yeah. Well, I'll come back next week, and uh, Leonard Brand will entertain you a little better than I have.